Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you out on this kind of gray day. We're glad to have the rain, though. We have some beautiful flowers up here on the altar. These on the uh, my right, your left, are in honor of uh, Alan and Jane Hoffman's 65th wedding anniversary, which was on the 8th. So congratulations to them. And these beautiful flowers are in celebration of Ellie Bossard's birthday, which is later this week. So happy birthday to her. And these beautiful yellow roses are from the wedding we hosted yesterday. I'm getting choked here. <laughs> the Hillsop, Hillsop and uh, Hardwood wedding. And so um, Brenna and Thomas are beginning their life together as a married couple. And so these and the pumpkins are left over from that too. So lots of celebrations and we're grateful for each one. And Jane and Alan and well their family invite you to the reception today from 2 to 4 at uh, 343 uptown. So I hope it's an open house. So I hope that you'll be able to make it and wish them uh, well wishes and see all their family who's in town. So Excuse me again. Wedding leftovers. <laughs> we had 26 high school kids here on uh, Wednesday to unpack our new chairs. Yeah, 26. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> they were done lickety split. So you can enjoy our new blue chairs, which are in the, uh, in the fellowship hall and in the storage room and in one of the classrooms. So we're so grateful uh, for the school to help us with all that. And so that's an awesome, awesome thing, uh, volunteering. They came last week and did the mission loading, and they came this week. And I don't know next week what we're going to do. I don't have any projects for them <laughs> this week coming up. But thank you again to the school and uh, uh, to the principal um, for doing that for us. All right, that's all the announcements I have this week, a farm meeting on a Tuesday night, so don't forget that uh, if you're on the farm committee. And happy birthday. There you see all our birthdays going on this week, Eileen and Ellie and Sandy and Kaylin, Jeanette and Quintus. So happy birthday to everybody and happy anniversary to the curls. So we're so glad to celebrate with them. God is good, friends. And all the time, let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Let's join together in our call to worship. God calls us on new journeys, asking us to follow. Give us courage to answer your call, Jesus. God breathes new life into empty places. We welcome your transforming power. God remakes our lives, calling us to service. We are God's people. We will serve in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and join in singing our opening praise, Morning Has Broken. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. God of all life, open our hearts to the majesty and wonder of your creation. Help us to choose to live the kind of life that is a joy in your sight and a blessing in our community. Grant us self-control that the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for truly you are our rock and our redeemer. We ask this in the name of the perfect witness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's youth and children's time. You're welcome to come down. Got our great boys here as usual. Good yeah, morning. he can come with you. Bring him along. Now nope, he right, won't come. Well, you there. can come. Nah, it's right, going to be an explosion, I'm telling you. Uh, I know the ingredients. It, it might be. It just <laughs> That's might fine. Be. You can watch from there. All right, yep, you'll be able to see. Oh, yep, come on down, Ben. We, you might be part of the action. You never know. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and here comes our good news crew. Come on in, Delaney. Hi, come on, sweetie. There's our, our token girl. Come on in, little token girl. Hi. <laughs> All these boys. <laughs> Lincoln's got to come see, too. <laughs> All right, well, I bet if you just let him be, he'll be okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Well, it's so nice to be here. How is everybody today? Ooh, bacon, soda, and vinegar. Hmm. <laughs> there might be some like action. Like I said, huh? there's going to be some action today. There is action, and it's about faith. 
So that's my first question. What is faith? Hang on. What is faith? Have you heard that word before? Nope, it's a new one for you. Okay, Carter, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Perfect. You believe in something, and we're going to find out what that something is that we need to believe in. We're going to find out which one is which. <laughs> so remember that, okay? Pretty soon, Carter right track, will Carter. be doing the children's okay? moments. <laughs> well, the Bible tells us that faith, and here's another big word, is assurance. It's like a promise of things hoped for. So that means it has something to do with believing, but not necessarily being able to see it or touch it or put your, you know, put your hands on it. So Jesus is talking in our story today that we'll hear from Pastor Mary about <clears throat> with the disciples, and he's talking to them about growing their faith. But, you know, faith isn't a muscle that we can, like, pump up, pump up, pump up, pump, pump up by ourselves. It doesn't work that way. It's about kind of like what Carter said at the beginning, what we're going to put our faith in, or hopefully in this case, who we're going to put our faith in. All right, Mr. Carter, so here we go. Nope, just, just sit down so everybody can see, and that way if it, if it gets a little excited, it'll be good. All right, so our baking soda is, Jesus. is our faith. Is our faith. And... If I say I have faith in, that I will turn into a pumpkin if I swallow a pumpkin seed. Or if I say I have faith that purple unicorns are going to come and trample the town. I, I think that's true. Then I believe it and I might even tell other people. So here's my purple that's unicorns. Here's my faith. Is there anything that happens? Nope. No, it falls flat because I put my faith in something strange, something that wasn't real. Hmm. All right, Carter, so if this is my faith. I don't think that will be me. That, what do you think this is going to be? Will! Oh, Carter, your channel. Good Will, job, Tanner. Will. Will, two <laughs> thumbs up. You are awesome. All right, so, so this is going to be <laughs> Jesus. And our scientist is explaining this All right, this to so us. let's see. Now you got to be watching. All right, so Will super answered. So here's Jesus. I want to put my faith in Jesus, and let's see what's going to happen. Thumbs the whole thing. Ah, uh, my water. <laughs> Because I put my faith in Jesus, it overflows, doesn't it? Oh my gosh. It spreads out. <laughs> it spreads out. Isn't that awesome? Great <laughs> answers. So the faith itself is not so important. It does 100% matter who I'm putting my faith in. And that faith doesn't have to be a lot. I didn't need the whole box of faith. Jesus said, it's okay if our faith is just as tiny as a mustard seed. And that's pretty tiny. Just a little bitty seed. That's all the faith that we need. So we don't have to do anything special to grow our faith. We just have to know that God has already done that for us. He sent us who? RJ, who did God send us? Jesus. He sent us Jesus. And why? No, we're not going to touch any because then it'll make your hands kind of smell from the vinegar. Why did God send us Jesus? What did Jesus do for us? Die on the cross. Die on the cross. Why? Because he wanted to um, cure our sins. Because he wanted to take away all our sins. You are correct. So Jesus did that. And we can, <laughs> no, just Mr. like Christ. this, share with other people. We learn about Jesus here from Pastor Mary and our teachers in, in kids club and youth group and all those things. So, but we, we can also then share with other people and invite them so that they will know too. It's important to tell people about Jesus, and then it will create great reaction 
just like our fizzing faith that we saw. So let's say a little prayer. You guys say it after okay, me. Are you ready? Here we go. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For all of your blessings. For all of your blessings. Thank you. Thank you. For the words of the Bible. For the words of the Bible. Thank you. Thank you. For being worthy of our trust. For being worthy of our trust. And help us. And help us. As we put our faith, as we put our faith in you, in you, help us, help us to tell others, to tell others about you too, about you too. We love you, God. We love you, God. And all God's people said, amen. Awesome job. Thank you Great guys for job helping today. me. Good sharing. And the Good News crew can go with Kaylin. So the nurse, nursery or the Good News crew is open <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Let's join in singing our next hymn of faith, uh, Be Still My Soul. You can remain seated as we sing.
part of our showing our faith is our offering. And so as we prepare to present our tithes and offerings to the Lord, I'd remind you to fill out your attendance registers and make sure everyone in your row has signed in. And um, just also, if you need to send anything to the office or to me, please write it on there. Or There's also the prayer request sheets in the pews, and you can send those up. And we'll be glad to include those in our time of prayer. So let us be people who are bold in our faith. And that means we are generous in our giving. And so let's present with joy and thanksgiving our tithes and offerings to the Lord at this time. Will the ushers please come forward? Let us pray together. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for all the many blessings that we have received. We're thankful for our homes and our families, for all of our material possessions and the many ways that you care for us. We ask, O oh Lord, that you help us to grow in generosity, to be giving because our giving shows how much we trust in you. It shows where our faith is. So receive these tithes and offerings and all who have given to the work of your kingdom through this church and help our church to use all our resources to share the good news of Jesus with this hurting world. We thank you for that great gift, the gift of faith, and also especially for the greatest gift given, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is in his name always that we come. And all God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. Well, today we're going to hear a passage from the Gospel of Luke uh, when Jesus is part of his teachings of the disciples. 
And let's hear God's word about uh, temptation and about the power of faith as small as a mustard seed. So let's join together, as is our tradition, let's share God's word together. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, There will always be temptations to sin, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with cause one of the little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then, if there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. And the Lord answered, if you have faith, even the small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and thrown into the sea, and it would obey you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Amen. Well, the story's told of a small town that uh, didn't have any liquor stores or any kind of nightclubs around. And eventually, the town council gave in and allowed a group to have a liquor license. And so they opened a nightclub on Main Street. And one of the churches in that town was furious about that decision. They'd protested it all the way. And so they decided after it got open that they were going to have several 24-hour prayer vigils and pray to the Lord that to remove that nightclub. In fact, their prayer was for it to be struck down by lightning, to be destroyed completely by fire. And so they prayed and they prayed. And surprisingly, not long after that, there was an electrical storm and that tavern got struck by lightning and burned to the ground. So the owners of the nightclub went to court to sue the church because they said their prayers had caused that nightclub to burn down. Well, the church, of course, hired a lawyer and they said, no, those, uh, those prayers did not do that. And uh, the judge said, I don't believe this, but I think that uh, the owner of the nightclub has more faith in prayer than the church members. How much do you believe in the power of prayer? And we're not necessarily talking about prayer today, but our prayers are a reflection of our faith. Prayers are powerful and effective. But do you live like that's true? And like, are you willing to deal with the consequences of what you ask for? You know, we ask for a lot of things, but are we really willing to deal with the consequences of what we ask for? That, that was the question for that church, and it's certainly a good question for us about our faith. Jesus set a standard to use if you want to evaluate how much faith you have. And the standard is not if you've cast a lot of mulberry trees into the, the ocean. That's not the standard to use. The standard that Jesus wants to use, which is interesting that he ties all these issues together, sin, faith, and what's the big one in this, in this whole passage, is forgiveness. How good are you at forgiving? Forgiveness, you see, is always the test of our faith. And we're not only to do it once. We're not only to do it twice for the same person. No. Seven times, not in a lifetime. Not in eternity. Seven times in one day. Seven times today. If someone sins against you, you tell them about it. That's part of the deal. You rebuke them. That's a harsh word. 
uh, but you offer to tell them that you've been hurt. Because too often what happens, we get hurt, and then we don't say a word. Maybe, you'd, like me, you give them the stink eye. You give them old stink eye, and then they're not, when they're not looking, of course. That's part of the stink eye deal, right? You don't do it while they're looking at you. You sneak around and you stink eye. But you need to rebuke them or tell them what has happened. And then if they repent, when they repent, you need to forgive them. Even if they do it over and over and over again. That seems very, very hard. To offer pardon where there is injury... That's part of the prayer of St. Francis, and that's a very hard part of our faith. But it's necessary. It's so necessary to free us to live boldly in God's kingdom. Because when you're harboring unforgiveness, your heart gets bitter and broken. And also, you may not realize this, but how you live your faith helps other people determine how they live their lives too and whether they're interested in faith. And we might say, well, we would never cause some little uh, person to sin. When you might think of these wonderful children, we would never cause one of these children to sin. Well, if you don't live out your faith, if you harbor unforgiveness and do other sins, you are causing people to stumble in their faith. And so sin is real and it's costly. And unforgiveness is one of the big sins that we often hold. And woe to us if we hold sin in our hearts. We must change. We must watch ourselves. And we must offer something new to God. Because that's the warning that Jesus is giving. We might say, well, this doesn't apply to us at all. No, it's exactly applying to us. You know, that was one of the wonderful things uh, this week on Thursday we were watching, as maybe some of you did, some of the events of Queen Elizabeth's life um, that happened after she passed. They were showing her different life. And one of the things that I don't think, you know, the news media didn't emphasize, but a few people did on Facebook, was that she was a person of faith, that her trust in Christ was important to her. And that uh, she believed in, and that gave her encouragement, she said, how to live out her her reign and how to reign. Now, she did that a lot more privately uh, than we may have wanted as other people of faith or because we might not have been aware of it. But it was clear that in her writings and in some of her, her teachings that she did have faith. And, and perhaps she was more private about it because she was the Queen of England and she wanted to welcome all her subjects into her. But it wasn't that she did not have faith. It was that her faith was more private. And you might say, well, that sounds good to me. Well, are you the Queen of England? Did I miss that somewhere? In fact, they don't have a queen now. They have a king. <laughs> And so Jesus is telling us to share our faith, uh, to live our faith, and we do that first and foremost by forgiveness. The most important thing is about faith is just do it. Now, that's a popular phrase from a company I bet you can name. Hmm? Nike, that's right. Nike's company is, says, just do it. You know, over the years, they've had some really interesting commercials with that. My favorite is when they have a lot of people with disabilities, clear disabilities, limbs missing, other things, and they're participating and competing in some really aggressive sports. And I am so impressed by that. You wouldn't necessarily think that folks like that would even want to do that. You know, you'd think if you're missing limbs that you might say, you know, just forget it. But instead, they decided to just do it. And now I think that's the same answer Jesus is telling to us. The disciples want more faith, and Jesus says, you don't need more faith. You need to use the faith you have. And that's what he's saying to us here. You know, it's when the disciples hear all this and they ask for more faith, it's almost like Jesus doesn't get the question. He doesn't understand it. You know, it might be like they're, they're saying, Jesus, do you not hear me? We can't do this. We cannot forgive someone seven times in one day. No, it's not going to happen. But Jesus is like, you can. You can do all things if you have faith. Your faith, if it's the size of a mustard seed, can tell a mulberry bush to jump into the ocean. 
It may not that you need more faith, it's that you need to use the faith that you have. And in order to see the power of your faith, you got to just do it. Do the best you can. I love that little kid. He's, he's ready. But you, it's really a defiant picture, but I love it anyway. Because if you look closely at his lips, he's got his mouth full of sand. And he's got a sand full, handful of sand. You know he's telling his mother, I'm going to do it. <laughs> just do it, right? If you're a person that deals with doubt like most of us are, the best way to deal with doubt is by doing something. Doing something about it. I've had folks come in at different times in their lives when horrible things have happened because horrible things happen. And they, they said, you know, Pastor, people are, that surprised me. They said, I don't have any faith right now. I don't have any faith anymore. My faith is gone. And as a pastor, that's a hard thing to hear. But I've had times when what the Lord seemed to tell me and I said to them was, that's okay. It's okay if you don't have faith right now because I have faith for both of us. I still have my faith, and I am going to keep living my faith, and I'm going to keep praying for you, and pretty soon you're going to find you have faith again. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, a person who got up at 4 a.m. and read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew. He read all sorts of different translations. He studied. He went out and witnessed. He preached. He did all sorts of things. Had times when he did not have faith. When he felt his faith had left him. And his friend wrote him and said, preach faith until you have it. Live your faith until it comes back to you. Now, when I tell people that I have faith still for them and I am praying for them, when I told that person that, if I hadn't continued praying for them, if I hadn't continued loving them and loving other people that are a little more challenging to love, if I hadn't continued to loving our great God and praising him, if I hadn't continued to do my studies, do my devotions, if I hadn't continued to tithe and practice my faith with extra giving, if I hadn't continued leading the church as the pastor, what would help them? Would they have thought I had faith? No, they would have thought I was just saying that. I was just talking the talk without walking the walk. My faith had to be an evidence to them, or my statement would be worthless. My faith needed to be in action, and it's the same for all of us. If we want to have more faith, we've got to live the faith we have. What you, clearly, what you do clearly shows what you believe. It's, that's the testimony of your faith. What you do shows what you believe. A group of French prisoners during World War II uh, were forced to work on a munitions factory building bombs. And they realized those bombs were being sent out to destroy their homeland. So they tried their very hardest to malfunction those bombs. And they wrote in, in they put little pieces of paper in those bombs that would not detonate uh, a note. And so when the French uh, people were so surprised when these bombs dropped, but they didn't detonate, they opened one of them carefully, of course. And then when they read these words, they were even more surprised. In French, uh, these folks had written, we're doing the best we can with what we've got. We are every chance we get. Doing the best you can with what you've got, where you are, every chance you get. What about you? Are you doing the very best you can with the faith that you have, where you're at? Or are you, like the disciples and many other people in this world, wanting more mustard? A dab won't do you. You need more. And when we say that, what we are expecting is God to come in and rescue us and God to take away the difficult challenges we might have. And that's legit. Of course we want God to do that. But that's not how faith works. Faith works by living through it, by having power to do things that might seem impossible. Like forgiving someone when we're not wanting to do it, when they don't necessarily even deserve it at times. But in our passage, they have sincerely apologized, and so they're trying to change. That's what repentance means. It's not that they just said, eh, it's no big deal. No, repentance means that they really are trying to change, and they can't do it. 
It's like when my husband says, I don't like that tone of voice you're using. And I use it again. Right? I don't want to. <laughs> yes, I do, obviously. It's hard to change, we know, right? And so it's hard to change that. And I may say, I'm sorry, you know, and I try again. And then later I use the same tone of voice again. So it's hard to change, but I'm sincere about it. Now, if he doesn't forgive me, is that going to help me grow and, and really reach into that new way I want to live? No. If he doesn't forgive me, I'm going to become more bitter or more angry. And that's the way with the people who've hurt you. It's not going to help them if you don't forgive them, and it's sure not going to help you. You know, when we ask God to help us, we, we think we want God to snap his fingers and the situation is going to change. But when God helps us, he wants us to put our feet into action. He wants us to move forward and do something. Do what you can do, where you're at. And when you do, you'll see miraculous things happen in your life and in the lives of others. Forgiveness takes action. It takes, you must do something. And what you really need to start to do if you want to forgive somebody is pray for them. You need to lift them up and yourself up. We've talked about this many times and ask God to care for you and them. And the question then is, I think for forgiveness, the question really is, do we have the confidence that God is going to take care of us, that God is taking care of us? Not that he's going to in the future, but right now. Because isn't that what this is all about? We're offended, we're hurt, and rightly so. Probably people did bad things, they're stupid things. But we don't, we want revenge. We don't want to trust that God's going to take care of it and them. We want to take care of it now ourselves. We want to see it reconciled right now. And not reconciled, we want to see payment. We want to see them suffer like we're suffering. But God wants us to have confidence that he is caring for us even in the midst of whatever is happening. That God is going to work things out as he promises, but he is working things out right now. And so if we are living in that pain, we need to really work on how can we start trusting God more. How can we live the faith we have? How can we put our mustard seed in action. I've got a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. Faith is powerful. It's an energy that's in abundance available to us and that tiny mustard seed can do it. You can activate the tiniest fragment of your faith and it will do amazing things. It will spill out into your whole life. It's like an atomic atom, when an atom, when it's split and it becomes an atomic power. And you can activate it simply by trusting in God. You can activate it by you living your faith, by believing that no matter what's going on, God is in control. And that God is going to bring out something amazing when you live trusting him. When the trials and challenges of this life are assailing you, instead of asking for more faith, you simply need to use the faith you have to call upon the God you know and believe that he is going to do things that seem impossible to do. Like to have someone change. If someone's wronged me seven times tomorrow, today, tomorrow I'm not going to be too hopeful that they're not going to, even if they've come and repented. But as a person of faith, of all things, I need to be hopeful. I need to give them the opportunity to do better. And I need to let go of that so I don't carry that grudge around, which makes me even grouchier than I am at times naturally. One day, a child saw Michelangelo uh, working on a ginormous piece of marble, and, and the chips were flying everywhere. And, and she said, what are you making? And Michelangelo said, there's an angel in here that I've just got to let loose. Right? You've heard that probably before. Well, did you ever think about that those people that are sinning against you have a good person inside of them? that needs help to get out, that's bound by all sorts of sin, and that you need to chip 
help chip away by forgiving them, to let them be free into being the good person that they're called to be. You can take action to help bring them into the light. Living our faith is important. A little boy named James had a desire to be a famous cheesemaker. And this is way back in the day when they had ponies and carts and didn't have all the fancy technology we have. And so he made cheese, and he went around Chicago trying to sell the cheese with his little pony patty. They didn't get too far, doing too well. After about a month or so, he, he's like, this is not working too great. And so he said, you know, Patty, there's something wrong here. What should we do? And then he said, you know what? I think we're going about this all wrong. I think we need to give our lives first to God and trust in Jesus and then see what God wants us to do and start listening to him more instead of just doing what I want to do. So the little boy prayed and little Patty was, you know, staying there help praying with him probably. And so after a while, then he started doing a lot better. And then one Sunday, he stood up as the Sunday school superintendent of the North Baptist Church in Chicago. And he said, I'd rather be a layman in this church and serve God. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to run the greatest corporation in America. He, that was most important to him. And so when you eat a piece of of Kraft American cheese, or have some Philadelphia cream cheese on your bagel, or have a drink of Maxwell House coffee, or a piece of Dorgiorno pizza, or even eat some Jello. you can think about this little boy named James L. Kraft, who decided to commit his life to the Lord first, to live his faith, and to serve God, and see what God would do with it. And God's going to make something amazing. You may have small faith, friends, but you have a big God. A big God who's able to do stuff that you can't even imagine right now. The best thing that can happen to you is have these re relationships reconciled. If you don't believe me, then talk to somebody who has broken, painful relationships in their lives and see what a burden it is to them. I can testify myself. You carry that around with you, and it hurts you. Use the faith you have and show your faith to others because that helps the little ones in this world know that you have faith. It helps people know God is at work. God has gifted you to make a difference in this world where you can, where you are. Not where I am, not where craft corporation is, but where you are in your life. You don't need to worry about how big your faith is. You need to use the faith God has had you. He has put you on this worth to actually do something. You know, the devil trembles when the person with the smallest faith the size of a mustard seed decides to use it. When the weakest servant says, Lord, I'll do it, I believe you, and actually does it, the devil is, has no power whatsoever. He's completely immobilized. Our actions as people of faith can move mountains, but we have to use our faith and trust our God. Amen? Amen. Friends, I have a couple more things to remind you about happening this week. The United Methodist Women are looking for bakers for Harvest Days. In two weeks on Harvest Day Sunday, we'll not have church here. I hope to see all of you downtown at 9.15, uh, downtown at the, uh, by um, Franklin Corner, where the stage is, for our church service at 9.15. And, but there on Saturday, the 24th, they'll be selling uh, baked goods at Treats. And you should have an insert in the bulletin. If you didn't pick up a bulletin, you can on the way out. And then on the 14th of this week, um, sat, this week, Wednesday, the UMW is going to meet at 8.30. UM, UWF, sorry, Women of Faith. So don't forget that's happening at 8.30. I think one calendar said 9, so it's at 8.30. Don't come at 9, you'll miss half the good fun. 
All right. Well, um, as we come to our time of prayer, please keep Helen Burton and her family in your prayers. Please keep uh, Marx's granddaughter and all the firefighters and fires going on in California in your prayers. Uh, please continue to pray for Kirby Krug and uh, Randall. Uh, keep those folks in your prayers. Um, and Ray Pulver, as he continues to recover, he's still doing well. And it's a long journey, but he's that new heart and kidney are going to help him get better. Glenn and Mary Siebert are feeling better, but Glenn's still got sinus and stuff going on. So keep him in your prayers. And Jill Mann's waiting for knee surgery. You may not have been aware, but uh, OSF is trying to start peace meals um, where you can uh, eat at the Gothic church or you can pick them up. Not just only delivery meals, but um, more of a, a place where you can eat together for anybody who's 60 or older. So um, if you're 60 and older and you, um, you don't necessarily need a meal, donations 350 but if we don't start supporting this right this next week or two, then OSF will think there's not enough interest in it. And the people that do need meals, um, they won't be able to have them. So um, I picked one up for my husband, Paul, because he turned 60 this year. Now, obviously, we don't need those meals, but anyone is available to do that. And it was a taco salad, and he really enjoyed it. So, I mean, that's an opportunity our community. That's a way you can live your faith. You see, you might say to yourself, I don't need those meals. And you and believe me, if you think it would be hard for you to walk in there, you want to just imagine how I felt walking in there, right? I am not 60 years old yet. <laughs> My husband says you're getting closer all the time. But, uh, but anyway, I did it to support the community. I'm living my faith, and I want you to live your faith. So I hope that it's anybody in any of the areas that uh, OSF serves. So Livingston County and any county that they serve, you can come even to Dwight and get meals uh, for that. So I hope you try to do that. The calendar of meals is out there with the contact number on the table right out behind the sound booth. So pick that up. And if maybe it's not for you, maybe you're not 60 yet, but you know somebody who is, then encourage them to sign up and do that. Because if we don't get enough critical mass people, again, they won't be able to have that. And that's something you can do. And believe me, it's tasty. <laughs> so it's not a torture thing to do. So I hope you prayerfully consider doing that and supporting that outreach in our community that will be important to a few people. There's a few people who really need that. But um, we need to have enough people supporting it so that they can, can happen, and probably more than a few. So spread the word and encourage people to do that. All right. Well, friends, uh, you take your private and unspoken concerns before God at this time, knowing he hears you. It's okay to pray for more faith, but just know God's like, the answer is going to be, yes, you have enough faith. <laughs> so know that that's his answer to us when we pray for more faith. Live the faith we have. That's, that's all we need is a mustard seed size. But pray for that and other concerns you might have. And, and start praying to live your faith and look for opportunities to do that. All right, let's go to God together silently and individually. I'll conclude us with a pastoral prayer. Then we'll all join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we are so thankful that you invite us to come to you at any time and any place in our lives. Right now, we ask, O oh Lord, that you forgive us when we don't use the faith that we have. Forgive us, O oh Lord, if our lack of faith and living our faith is causing other people to stumble. Help us, O oh Lord, to be more diligent in what we say and what we do. To be more mindful in how you love us and how you forgive us. And that can empower us to offer forgiveness to others and trust that you are trying to bring out something good in their lives and that we're part of that wonderful transformational process. So help us, O oh Lord, to forgive and encourage others, not to enable bad behavior. That's not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is about transforming love 
and transforming lives, our own and others, for good. Lord, thank you for the many ways that you hear us and that you deliver us. We continue to pray for rain and thank you for the little rain we've received and hope that the rest of today we might get a little more rain, Lord, for our crops and our trees and our earth. We pray for the fires in California and the firefighters. We ask that your great protection continue to rest on them and that you provide the rain they need in that dry and on hard areas right now. And Lord, we pray for those who are making the journey home to you. We pray for Helen Burton and others that are on that sacred time of transition between this life and the next. We pray for others that are waiting for surgeries or waiting for procedures to be scheduled like Kirby and Randall and Jill. We pray that your special anointing will rest on them. We pray for Ray and Glenn and others who are in the healing process. And we pray that you'll continue to strengthen them, especially Ray, that you'll let his new heart and kidney be working very well and continue to guide all the doctors and his care teams that to provide him the best opportunity for good health he can have and help his body to continue to recover from those major surgeries and gain strength and just to, to be able to live the life that you're calling him to. Help us, O oh Lord, to live the life you're calling us to. We thank you for the many ways you love us and hear us and deliver us and help us to show the, our faith by what we say and what we do. We ask all of this always in the one whom our faith is in, which is Jesus Christ, who gives us the ability to do the impossible. We continue in our time praying as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we prepare to depart and sing our closing praise, God of grace and God of glory. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. I forgot to mention that, right. Right. Yes, yes. It's been 21 years since 9-11, and that, it, the pain continues. So please, let's just quickly lift up. Lord, just pour out your comfort and healing on folks that are still dealing with all the effects of 9-11 here in our country and around the world. Please provide them with their mental and emotional healing and strength to surround your great arms around them and give them comfort and hope. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Rosie, so much. As I meant to mention that, and I rode right over it. Let's stand together and sing our closing praise. We'll just sing, and I know you'll love this, we'll just sing the first and second verse. I'll be nice to you up there. <laughs> Let's stand together as we sing.
prepared to go forth. Be filled with God's wisdom. Be strong and courageous. Serve God in all you say and do. Go forth knowing that you go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that our great God, the, Criti- the Trinity, the creator of all that is, the most powerful of all that you can imagine or think, our God is with us. And our faith empowers us to do the impossible. So go forth and serve in God's name in trust and in love because our God is with us. Amen. Amen.